Hi everyone, I am Katherine Golden, RN CEO and Executive Director of LEAF 411. Thank you so much for joining us today for our fourth LEAF Learning Series, Cannabis Use for Pain Management. Hopefully you've been able to watch the quick tutorial to help you navigate the Hopin platform, but if not, don't worry, we have staff on hand to guide you where you need to go by way of our chat feature on the right of your screen or by following the prompts on the left that indicate which sessions are live. Everything you see here today was orchestrated and led by LEAF 411's Chief Nursing Officer, Eloise Thiessen, and the incredible CanOcasions team. Eloise is a board-certified adult geriatric nurse practitioner with over 21 years experience in nursing. She started her own cannabis practice seven years ago, and she has treated over 7,000 patients using cannabis. Eloise is the current president of the American Cannabis Nurses Association and is currently the interim director of the Medical Cannabis Program at the Pacific College of Health and Science San Diego. Eloise is the CEO of Radical Health, which has partnered with LEAF 411 for the ongoing LEAF Learning Series events that provides the evidence-based content you will see here today. A big thank you to the CanOcasions team. That includes Jen, Susan, and Anne. Without their continued excellence in event planning and organization, we wouldn't be able to bring you the professional clinical education you're about to experience. I would like to kick off this event with a huge thank you to all of our generous sponsors. First, our premier sponsor, Lightshade. And here's a quick video about the dispensary that focuses on quality, extensive brand selection, and compassionate customer service. For me, it was about trying to figure out how to protect the people I cared about. The military was the easiest route I could find to do that. The teams were the best unit I could find to teach me how to do that. Parkour, martial arts, military service, it does not matter what it is. I do that to serve my family. I had the next 20 years of my life plotted out. And in an instant, that all became a lie. My name is Harley, and I'm a martial artist, a tresseur, and a veteran. I knew I wanted to be in the military since I was young. When you're training to be a SEAL, they, they push you incredibly hard. On April 8th of 2010, we were doing log PT out on the beach. Uh, we got to an exercise called the overhead toss, and something went wrong. The log missed my hand and hit my head, and that's how I got hurt. Took 200 pounds of log right to the dome. The very next cognitive thought I've got after getting hit was waking up in the hospital surrounded by doctors. From what the doctors told me, said I was hit at approximately two in the afternoon. My next cognitive thought where I was actually responding to questions and everything came at 10.45 that night. Physical side effects immediately were immense pain in the head and vertigo, and I wasn't initially able to move the left side of my body changed my life as far as like side effects and everything goes was excruciating migraines like constant excruciating migraines and i wake up and i go to sleep every single day with a migraine the pain that comes along with migraine is not like a normal headache at all it overwhelms your sensory your eyes your sense of touch everything you're completely overwhelmed when you've got kind of a migraine. I can't, I can't walk, I can't feed myself, I can't go to the bathroom by myself. It's incredibly challenging. VA's solution for pain management was going to be uh, pills. We were going to be trying a number of different medicines, anything from like baby aspirin all the way up to Dilaudid. We also tried like some antipsychotics, some anti seizure meds, muscle relaxers, nothing yielded any consistent results. At 20 years old, I was taking 12 different medications all at once. I was a mess. I was also drinking a lot. Um, I lost a couple friends over that, rightfully so, because, well, I wasn't exactly pleasant to be around at that point. I lost who I was completely. I didn't know what I stood for. I didn't know where I was going in life. And I had no clue what I wanted to do anymore. When I was in, there was still an overwhelming sense of camaraderie. I had my boys that I could count on. When you go 
from having that kind of tight-knit community feeling to nothing. That fast, it is a shock. And you feel incredibly alone. No matter how many friends or family you surround yourself by, it just isn't the same thing. I love my friends and I love my family, but there's something different about a military bond. October 1st of 2012 was the day I got out of the military and the day I first tried cannabis. Things, uh, things turned around immediately from there. I found that I was able to function a lot better, help me manage my pain and get to the point where I was able to strengthen my body back to that level of being able to train properly again. Getting back to that baseline of fit to where I could do a push-up, do a sit-up, go for a run again. This stuff isn't just a recreational drug. It is something that people use to help manage their daily lives, be that pain management, depression, anxiety, whatever. It doesn't matter. If we made it more readily available, I honestly do believe we'd work better as a nation. There's so much division going on in this world right now. If cannabis can be a part of something that brings us back together, I won't be a part of that. Martial arts has always been a part of my life. I studied Taekwondo and Krav Maga. After I got my black belt in Taekwondo, I was able to certify in Krav. Those two styles put together, the Taekwondo is going to get you your long range striking with your kicks and your standard punches. Krav will be more useful in close quarters, the stuff that's actually going to save your life. There's four A's of self-defense. There's awareness, avoidance, acceptance, and action. Parkour is hard avoidance. If I can get up into a second story balcony, while he's still down on the ground, that's 15 feet separating me from him. If he can't do the same thing, I've already won. A lot of places when they employ a veteran, disabled or not, they don't understand what they're getting. Lightshade had a really good grasp on it. Your management team that is there fighting with you, working alongside you, has your back and is saying, you know, there's gonna be days where you can't do this job properly, Take your time, come back when you can serve us. That's monumental. That kind of feeling, it is, it's, it's incredible. It really is. When it comes down to like helping vets and everything like that, if you know any, call them. I cannot count the number of times I have been sitting in a room just wishing I had somebody to talk to. It's inexcusable that we have veterans dying in line at the VA. 26 veterans a day kill themselves because they are not getting the proper care, because they are not getting the proper compassion from the people that they signed up to serve. Call. If you have somebody you think might be struggling, reach out. That in and of itself, happy memories can save your life. If you're going down that road where you're thinking you might be to a point where you're hurting yourself, veteran or otherwise, just don't. It's not worth it, people. You have value and you bring value to this world. If there's anybody looking for medical advice as far as like how to use cannabis or how to get into that, Leaf 411's a lovely asset. These are all medical professionals, nurses that have the background. It's a great asset to use. If you have any questions, that's it. I'm Harley, I'm a martial artist, I'm a tresseur, and I'm a veteran. Wow, that, sorry, um, that gets me every time. Um, thank you, Lightshade, that was wonderful. Uh, Lightshade dispensaries have nine locations and growing here in Colorado. They believe the difference is night and day with their top shelf flower, edibles, concentrates, tinctures, topicals, and merchandise. Lightshade is our biggest supporter and we truly wouldn't be here tonight without their continued support, so please visit a Lightshade dispensary near you. I wanna say a heartfelt thank you to all of our virtual booth sponsors you can visit with today that are all a part of the LEAF 411 family of support members. They include Love's Oven, Kazi, Texas Buddies, Hemp Lily, Miriam's Hemp, Medically Correct, which are the creators of Incredibles, Quick and True Pura, Trust Biologic, Calm Better Days, and Where's Weed is a wonderful resource to find the dispensaries you're looking for. 
You can find all of these supporters on the LEAF 411 website under the resources page. These members generously pledge monthly donations to LEAF 411, and this is what continues to keep the nonprofit services free for you, just like tonight. At LEAF 411, we know that using cannabis as medicine is a journey. Like learning a new language, it takes more than one lesson to become fluent. You have questions, but you don't know who to ask, and that's where LEAF 411 comes in. LEAF 411 began as a solution to a problem of where do you go when you have questions and who do you trust? We're going to play a short video to tell you more about LEAF 411 and highlight all of the programs and services that LEAF 411 has to offer. Golden, RN CEO and co-founder of LEAF 411. After taking in so much invaluable cannabis education, you may be thinking, all oh, this is fantastic. But what about my specific pain, my sleep issues, my type of anxiety or depression for myself or a loved one? Where do I go now to get all my personal questions answered? At LEAF 411, we believe that using cannabis as medicine is a journey. Like learning a new language, it takes more than one lesson to become fluent. Likewise, we don't expect you to walk away from a short cannabis presentation with all the knowledge you need. You probably have questions, but you may not know who to ask. And that's where LEAF 411 began, as a solution to a problem I saw from my personal experience because I too had these same questions. I had a family member thrown into survival mode, diagnosed with stage four cancer, very young, children at home, and given only a few years to live. As a registered nurse, I knew how to access the research. I could be there on the phone, ready to answer my family's questions and direct them to the appropriate resources. But what about everybody else? What about all the people that don't have a medical professional in their lives? I'd like to take a minute to tell you more about LEAF 411 and quickly highlight all of the programs and services that LEAF 411 has to offer. Too many consumers brand new to cannabis find themselves unsure of where to turn for help. Out-of-pocket costs for access to medical professionals and finding conflicting advice all over the internet. As I'm sure you know, there is misinformation all over the web. And unfortunately, it's all too easy to get caught up in misleading and false marketing tactics. Looking for answers, many consumers turn to dispensary employees, not realizing that bud tenders are not allowed to answer questions that could be seen as giving out medical advice. Because cannabis or marijuana is a Schedule I drug, not enough healthcare professionals are knowledgeable in cannabis therapeutics. Additionally, the modern American healthcare system is set up that patients get the quality and quantity of care they can afford and have easy access to, creating a lack of trusted resources for your cannabis questions. LEAF 411's mission to give hope for a better quality of life, not a detachment from life as some may think. We believe that knowledge is power, especially when it comes to being in control of your own health care. The more you know, the better equipped you are to make sound decisions about your health. LEAF 411 believes quality health care should be accessible and affordable for everyone. LEAF 411 was built on the foundation of trust. When you call, there is a registered nurse answering the phone. Nurses were voted the most trusted profession for 18 years in a row. We get a lot of callers who are brand new to the cannabis plant and are looking for products and retailers or dispensaries that they can trust. When discussing cannabis products with callers, our loyalty is first and foremost to the public. While the cannabis industry gives philanthropic dollars to LEAF 411, it is vitally important for our community to know that we consider ourselves to be patient and consumer advocates first and foremost. You can access cannabis education from trained medical professionals by way of our three programs. First is the hotline program. 
You have Monday through Friday access to cannabis trained registered nurses. With this hotline, we've helped our public understand important information like the difference between CBD hemp and marijuana, how to read the sometimes very confusing product labels, which is vital to understanding how many milligrams you are actually consuming. We also have a chat feature with access to send us a message. In addition to the hotline program, we educate in the community through our community outreach program, like our virtual leaf learning series events. Our community outreach program is where Leaf 411 comes to you. We meet you wherever you are. That could be virtual, in your home for an event, or at a community group like your veterans meetings, various support groups, senior living facilities, etc. As part of our community outreach program that is focused on public access to balance education and an answer to the misconception that there is not enough cannabis research, we created a robust LEAF library. This library is user-friendly, has a searchable database that we built for you to see the same study research and peer-reviewed articles that we do. You don't have to take our word for it. You can see the science for yourselves. Just type in almost any condition and you will see many links to articles and studies that you can print and take to your clinical team for a candid cannabis conversation. LEAF 411 could not do all of this for free for you without the charitable support of the industry members you see here today and listed on our website. All of these members give LEAF 411 philanthropic funding to help keep our services free for you. Not only do our members donate the money needed to keep these programs free to our public, but they also donate their products and services to our affordability program for patients in need. But we can't help as many people as possible without your help. There are a few ways you can get involved. We would love you to tell everyone you know about our free community support programs. Help spread Lee 411's mission to family, friends, and any businesses that would be open to hearing about the public service we provide. Please tell your favorite dispensary or brand that you would like them to become a Lee 411 member to support the programs that support this community. We would kindly ask you to please support the cannabis businesses that support us. These businesses truly care about harm reduction with cannabis and to prove it, they are more than willing to donate monthly to LEAF 411 to help keep our public safe. Finally, if you have the ability to donate and support our mission, then we are truly honored. Your financial support helps ensure that every community member has equal access to the same healthcare resources everyone else has. With the charitable support of the cannabis industry and your one-time or recurring donations, we've been able to build and grow three different programs identifying and serving needs throughout our communities. Through our free hotline program, we've been able to guide people in over 35 states towards safe and effective use, and our outreach is growing every month. With your continued support, we can hire more nurses to support our busy hotline. Pre-COVID, we were educating about this public service in person, and now we've had to adapt to a virtual outreach to continue meeting you where you are, where we all are in our homes. What does all this mean for you? We're helping people save money, especially for brand new cannabis consumers. Calling us to get the 411 helps prevent the need for 911. Instead of using products wrong, get the information from us for free and learn ways to prevent the need for a costly ER visit. We can also save people time. An average call, which is typically between 20 and 40 minutes, you can get all of your questions answered and be pointed in the right direction. If you compare that with say consulting Dr. Google, where you're desperately trying to find the right keywords to type in and hopefully find some of the information you're looking for, then trusting that source and then reading and understanding what is written all by yourself, the LEAF 411 service can save you time and energy by allowing the professionally trained nurses to guide you to those resources. 
To close out the who, what, and why Leaf 411 was created for you, I'd like to ask you to please give our free cannabis trained nurse hotline a call. Get the answers you need to ensure you are well on your way to a successful and responsible use of this medicinal plant. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Catherine. Always great to hear about all the great services that Leaf 411 offers the public. Um, so now it's time for our program. And just a little bit about our program today, we're gonna to be discussing cannabis use for pain management. That's our educational focus today. And you'll get to hear shortly from our keynote speaker, Dr. Dustin Sulak, followed by breakout sessions on many specific pain management topics. So briefly, I would just like to mention that in 2017, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine released their report on the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids and found that there was substantial evidence to support that cannabis is effective for chronic pain in adults. Yet many patients are still using opioids or other medications to treat their chronic pain. In fact, just this week, the National Center for Health Statistics reported that deaths from drug overdoses rose by 30% since 2019, with opioids, primarily fentanyl, driving those death rates. Some facts about the opioid crisis from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. We've seen between 21 to 29% of patients who have prescription opioids misuse them. Around 8 to 12% of chronic pain patients use opioids will develop opioid use disorder. Roughly 4 to 6% of those who misuse opioids will start using heroin. And of those who use heroin, 8% of them started with prescription opioids. Opioids should not be used for first-line therapy in chronic pain. At LEAF 411, we wanted to bring you the latest research on cannabis use for pain management so that you can make informed decisions about whether cannabis is an appropriate option. Whether you're looking to add cannabis into your regimen to replace or reduce medications or to supplement your current pain management, we hope you find today's event invaluable so you can start incorporating the medicinal plant into your regimen safely and effectively. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Dustin Sulak. Dr. Dustin Sulak is an osteopathic physician licensed in Maine as a general practitioner. He's an expert in integrative medicine, the intelligent combination of conventional and alternative approaches to healthcare. You seem to be getting some feedback. Is that me? I don't hear it, Eloise. You don't? OK. okay. I'm hearing some feedback. He's long been fascinated by mind-body medicine, spirituality and healthcare, and natural approaches to routing health and healing. He's an expert in cranial and biodynamic osteopathy, a clinical hypnotherapist, Reiki sensei, practitioner of Qigong and yoga, and has studied with numerous conventional and alternative healers and physicians. Dr. Sulak's clinical practice focuses on treating refractory conditions in adults and children. He received undergraduate degrees in nutrition science and biology from Indiana University, a doctorate of osteopathy from Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, and completed an osteopathic internship at Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency. Dr. Sulak is the founder of IntegrateHealthAndHealer.com, a medical cannabis education resource. He's a passionate teacher of clinicians, patients, and industry professionals, and sits on the board of directors for two nonprofit focused on education, cannabis education, the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and Patients Out of Time. And I can't think of anybody better to talk today to us about cannabis and chronic pain and opioid use disorder. So from there, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Dr. Sulak, and welcome. Thank you, Eloise, for the uh, substantial introduction. And I, I just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this event and love the work that LEAF 411 is doing. This is great. So let's jump in because we don't have a lot of time. And this is a huge topic, cannabis and opioids. And so in my practice, treating patients with chronic pain over the last 11 years, we've had a huge amount of people that have come here because they've been given opioid treatments and kind of gotten dependent or even addicted to the opioids and wanted to find a way out. And for so many, cannabis uh, is that way out. And um, even more importantly, perhaps cannabis is a way 
to treat chronic pain without having to go down that road in the first place. So today I am just going to kind of summarize some of the basics of how cannabis and opioids work together, especially in chronic pain. And then I'm gonna focus on a handful of newer papers that have been published just in the last six months or so that have looked at um, some kind of newer topics like cannabis, not just in patients with chronic pain, but in patients with opioid use disorder, and also to explore the role of CBD or the role that CBD might have in helping patients discontinue opioids or reduce their opioid dosage. So let's jump right in. Okay, so cannabis and opioids. I like to start with a reminder that these are both plants uh, produced by Mother Nature that have incredible capacities to relieve suffering in humans. And in addition to the fact that we can find these both in nature, we also find analogs of these plants and the medicines they contain in ourselves. So all of us have an endocannabinoid system that is highly active in regulating pain among many other functions in the body. But we also have this endogenous opioid system, the endorphin and enkelephin system that uh, produces molecules with similar activity to those found in the opium poppy and uh, similar in activity to the pharmaceutical opioids. And so I like to just start here. It's not that cannabis is good and opioids are bad. It's that they both have a role, certainly in our physiology. And it turns out that our physiology uses cannabinoids and opioids together quite a bit. That's actually more common. It's not like we have to choose one or the other. We get to use both. And it turns out that the pain signaling pathways in the brain, spinal cord, and in the periphery use cannabinoids and opioids to help us mitigate pain just based on our own physiology. So that's a good tip for maybe we could use these in combination when we're working with an external pharmacy. And so there's been a, a large body of research and I'm just gonna kind of go through this quickly, but here's a review article from 2017 looking at the preclinical studies. So these are animal studies. And it turns out that 17 out of 19 studies that tested the combination of cannabinoids and opioids found that there was this synergistic effect, meaning a greater than additive effect from the cannabinoids and the opioids when it comes to relieving pain. On average, the effective dose of morphine when administered with THC was 3.6 times lower than the effective dose of morphine when administered alone. Similar results, but even more profound with codeine, administered with THC, the effective dose is 9.5 times lower than administered without THC. So imagine, and, and these are doses of THC that are really not analgesic or just barely at that level of analgesia. So this isn't a huge dose of THC. What these animal studies are suggesting is that adding a little THC to an opioid can make the opioid much more effective in models of pain. And so the big question is, does this translate to our human patients? If it did, that would be amazing. Another thing that we see in the preclinical studies is this retention of efficacy. We know that if you give animals or humans uh, opioid doses repeatedly, the benefit tends to wear off, right? They build tolerance to the analgesic effect, and that's typically via a downregulation of the opioid receptors. They, they have less opioid receptors and, and less capacity to, to uh, dampen the pain through those pathways. But if you look at the animals that received THC and opioids, they actually had an upregulation of opioid receptor proteins in their sp spinal cord, and they avoided building tolerance to the analgesic effects of the opioids. Again, if we could see this in human patients, if this did translate, that would be an incredible tool, an incredible solution for people with chronic pain that are using opioids. And so does it translate? Well, we certainly have some evidence and I'm gonna go through a little bit to show you. Here's a very experimental model where 18 healthy cannabis users were exposed to six different combinations of opioids and cannabis or placebo. So they basically either got a placebo oxycodone two and a half milligram oxycodone, which most of you know doesn't do much for an adult, or five milligrams of oxycodone. And then they either got placebo cannabis, which was 0% THC, 
or regular cannabis, which was 5.6% THC from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And I'm sure most of you know that's not really regular cannabis. That's extremely low quality cannabis. They basically had to dunk their arm in ice water and right when the pain started, and then they were uh, watched for how long they could keep their arm in there. And they answered a bunch of questionnaires. And so if you look at the results of this, when administered alone, only five milligrams of oxycodone increased the pain threshold versus placebo, the, the pain threshold and the tolerance of pain. Now that makes sense, right? We can't prescribe two and a half milligrams of oxycodone. The, the lowest prescribable dose is five because that's the dose that tends to work. But in this study, two and a half milligrams of oxycodone combined, combined with the cannabis did work. It, it uh, had a statistically significant effect and it produced modest increases in positive subjective ratings related to oxycodone, meaning it made them kind of like the oxycodone more, which might be um, a factor for abuse liability. But I think what's so interesting to look at in these numbers, and you don't have to study the numbers the most, but uh, when asked about how strong was the drug? Did it, is it a good drug? Do they like it? Would they take it again? All of these kind of subjective ratings. Out of all six conditions, the participants preferred two and a half milligrams of oxycodone with cannabis. They liked that better than the five milligrams of oxycodone with the cannabis, maybe because that felt too strong. And so I think if people are preferring a lower dose of oxycodone in combination with cannabis, that's a very good sign. Now, this is an experimental model. The cold presser test is more of an acute pain model. It may not be fully relevant to people with chronic pain, but this just shows that some of that large body of animal evidence is translating to humans and that there is a synergistic effect. And of course, this is not new. This is very old. So if you look at um, one of the best-selling compound medicines of the 19th century, it was chloranodyne, which combined morphine, cannabis, and capsicum, which is the hot chili pepper. And this provided a phytoopioid, phytocannabinoid, and phytovanilloid uh, medication in one preparation. So essentially affecting the three known endogenous systems that mediate pain. And arguably this product from the previous century uh, may have provided better outpatient pain relief than anything that's available today. So let's talk about the safety. Is it safe to use cannabis and opioids together? Well, as you know, any drug has what's called the therapeutic index. And so for alcohol, for example, uh, the therapeutic index is 10. This, this means if one drink gets you feeling a little something, then 10 drinks could kill you. Intravenous heroin has a very low therapeutic index of five. Cannabis, of course, there's really no lethal dose, so its therapeutic index is infinite. Now, in the human brain, we have cannabinoid receptors all over the place. In fact, there's more of these receptors in the brain than any other type of neurotransmitter receptor, except Thankfully, in one area, there's extremely low densities of cannabinoid receptors, or they're practically absent, and that's the part of the brain that controls our breathing and our heart rate, the cardiorespiratory centers. These cardiorespiratory centers happen to have high levels of opioid receptors, and this is why if we take too many opioids, it can cause a fatal overdose. So... When we're working with cannabinoids and opioids together, we get a synergistic effect on the pain relief, but not on the cardiorespiratory suppression. So you could think about this therapeutic index of opioids. If we add cannabis, the effective dose goes down, but the lethal dose does not go down. So we get a wider therapeutic index, which makes the opioids safer. And I, I truly believe that if every opioid analgesic had just a little bit of THC in it, this world would be a, a safer place. There we'd have a lot less opioid relating problems. So can human patients use cannabis to replace opioids if they're treating chronic pain? An important question. I'm just going to fly through some of the evidence that answers this question with a very strong yes. There's been a large number of survey studies like this one looking at patients and asking them, you know, since you added cannabis, were you able to reduce your opioids? And you can see out of these 215 patients taking opioids, about 40% of them said it helped them reduce their opioids a lot. And then another 36% said it helped them reduce their opioids slightly. We see, again, uh, this is a, a, actually an international study, and looking at all the different types of drugs that are replaced by cannabis, 
And you can see that opiates are the number one category here with so many patients that are using cannabis as a substitute for opioids. We have another survey study, 1,300 patients, 80% reported substituting cannabis for traditional pain medications, including 53% substituting for opioids, also very relevant in this population. There's a lot of benzodiazepine substitution. Why? Fewer side effects, better symptom management. And you can see here, uh, bl the blue bar is stopped using. So uh, over 70% of the opioid users in this survey had completely stopped using opioids. And then a substantial additional amount had reduced their dose. And again, you can see the benzodiazepines, the gabapentinoids, the NSAIDs. There's just broad drug substitu substitution going on in all of these different categories. Here's an older study that is uh, pretty profound, though. Uh, 73 chronic pain patients using opioids at baseline, given some cannabis with very few instructions on how to use it. Six months later, or about seven months later, 44% of them had stopped taking their opioids. So I think you're getting the point now. There's a lot of observational data, even though we don't have that many uh, like gold standard clinical trials that kind of have a placebo intervention and a cannabis intervention and say, oh, in, in patients with chronic pain, this is how cannabis works compared to placebo for reducing opioids, we have a ton of observational data that supports this, including a study that I published from uh, data from our practices. This was a, another survey that we administered to the patients in all three of our practices. Ba back then we had three sites, two in Maine and one in Massachusetts. Now we're down to one, thankfully. But we had 525 patients that had been using opioids for at least three months to treat chronic pain. They added cannabis to their treatment. And again, I, I think the, the first uh, question that I want to focus on here is, how has your opioid drug use changed since you started using cannabis? Again, we see 40% stopped using opioids altogether. And another almost 40% or a little more than 40% had reduced their dose. Only 1% increased opioids since starting cannabis. What about average pain level? Did they just stop their opioids, but their pain is worse? No, only 2.6% found that their pain was worse. Most found their pain was quite a bit better, including uh, you, you know, um, between 40 and 100% decrease in pain. We're seeing here, this is uh, about 50% of the patients. So just incredible results. And, and again, there's some limitations here that we'll discuss on the next slide. But I think these are the most important results. We have... Uh, 80% of people either stopping or reducing their opioid dose, yet 80% also say their ability to function has improved since starting cannabis. 87% say their quality of life has improved since starting using cannabis. And this is the kind of outcome that I think we're looking for as clinicians. So again, this is all subjective. There's no control group. And there's a lot of selection bias that happens in my practice and probably in most of your practices. People want to get off their opioids. They come to you specifically determined to use cannabis as a substitute for their opioids and wanting to know how to do it. And we can help them with that. But that might be different than a population that's not highly motivated. So our results showed a remarkable percentage of patients reporting cessation and decreasing opioid use. And we suggested that one reason for our results may be the focused protocol that we used at these study sites. It wasn't just, here's a certification card for cannabis, good luck getting off of your opioids. We have a protocol for how patients can use cannabis to achieve this goal. And then finally, a, a, systemic, a systematic review of nine studies looking at cannabis in the setting of chronic pain and opioid usage. You can see over 7,000 subjects in these nine studies. And the researchers found that somewhere between 32 and almost 60% of patients with non-cancer chronic pain reduced their opioids after adding cannabis. And the magnitude of the dosage reduction was between 64 and 75% on average. So again, big, big numbers. I feel like this is, uh, you know, we've been talking about this for years now. We've been seeing it in the clinic. This is still big news. And I, and I hope it gets out there because the opioid problem is still a huge problem. And we have this tool and a lot of evidence showing that this tool can be helpful. So I want to talk about opioid use disorder, because there's a lot of overlap between chronic pain and opioid use to treat the pain and maybe opioid dependence versus more of a 
uh, kind of strictly defined uh, addiction medicine style opioid use disorder. And in my practice, I never like to put people in one bucket or the other. There's usually a big mix of pain and trauma and anxiety and all these things that people are using opioids to treat. And I think that that's the most important question. When somebody's misusing any substance, opioids included, I like to frame it as, well, the opioids are probably not the problem. The opioids are actually the solution. Let's find out what the problem is, and then let's see if there's a different solution that can be even healthier than this one. And that, so let's get to the underlying problem. That's that's my clinical approach with anyone that's that's having uh, trouble in a relationship with any type of substance or um, behavior. And so, so some new data. Uh, because previously, well, I'll just go back aside. Previously, we had just a few little studies that showed, while well, cannabis users may be more likely to remain in treatment for opioid use disorder, they may have less withdrawal symptoms, and uh, they're, they're, they have no worse outcomes. You know, that's basically the starting point until just maybe six months ago when some new studies came out. So this was a study on cannabis use and non-fatal opioid overdose. Uh, the background information was that three previous studies showed lower opioid overdose mortality at the state level or at the county level uh, when cannabis became accessible. One study found increased rates of opioid overdose after implementation of medical cannabis laws, and that study actually suggested that the uh, association was spurious. And uh, these studies really are just looking at the big population. They don't confirm whether the individual who has opioid use disorder, who's being treated for it, what happens to them if they use cannabis? And so um, this was funded by the uh, National Institute of uh, Mental Health, 446 patients from four urban methadone clinics in southern New England and Washington state. And they were asked questions about overdosing, requiring naloxone, how many times in the last 12 months, and then asked about their cannabis use and some other covariates. And so what you can see here is those who reported using cannabis at least once a week over the past month were 71% less likely to report a non-fatal opioid overdose over the past year compared to those who used cannabis less frequently or didn't use it at all. And you can see quite a, a, a strong trend here, at least weekly and every day. It was, it was quite different than once in the last month or none at all. These are non-fatal opioid overdoses. And again, uh, well, let's just uh, a, a little bit more details here. Cannabis users had slightly lower average methadone dose than infrequent or non-users, 75 milligrams versus 85 milligrams, but similar levels of pain, similar rates of unprescribed opioid use. Older age at first opioid use, stable housing in duration, and the methadone maintenance therapy of at least one year were also factors that were associated with a lower likelihood of overdosing. And so basically, in this study, the patients that used cannabis once weekly or more were less likely to have an overdose in the last year. That may not be a causal association. Uh, maybe there's something else going on there, but it's suggestive uh, that outcomes may be better for cannabis users instead of what I think the uh, uh, you know behavioral medicine community tends to default to is that cannabis is going to make this problem worse. And this study suggesting that it could make it better. Here's another study that's uh, recent uh, on cannabis use and exposure to fentanyl in people who are on. Uh, who are receiving treatment for opioid use disorder. Little background information, fentanyl was involved in two thirds of the 47,000 opioid related deaths in the US and three quarters of those in Canada. And there's limited data on the effectiveness of our current treatments, methadone and suboxone, in the context of the fentanyl crisis, because this is fairly new uh, compared to a lot of the studies that have been done on those treatments. And so these were participants um, from Vancouver, 819 of them. Uh, they received a questionnaire that was administered by an interviewer every six months and a urine sample that was looking for fentanyl, THC, and then they uh, found out some other information about their sociodemographics and their comorbidities. And so you can see here that both adjusted for other covariates and unadjusted, just the raw data, the presence of THC in the urine drug screen was associated with a reduced likelihood of exposure to fentanyl. 
So the cannabis users were less likely to be exposed to fentanyl. There were some other factors that were also associated with less exposure to fentanyl, including older age um, and the urine drug screen uh, positive for either methadone or buprenorphine, which is the active ingredient in Suboxone. And there, there were a number of factors that were associated with more fentanyl exposure. And so you can see here statistically significantly less fentanyl exposure in the cannabis users compared to the non-users. Again, this might not be a causal association, but it's sub suggestive that people receiving treatment for opioid use disorder who use cannabis may have better outcomes. And this is not evidence that they're gonna have worse outcomes. And I, I keep emphasizing this point because there's the stigma in the uh, drug addiction community and I think that this is uh, this is just a you know something that we have to overcome so that people can use cannabis and uh, be uh, feel like they have a place because so many of these people don't feel like they have a, a place in their community and if they're ostracized for using cannabis and that's helping them uh, th this is this is just crazy and I've been hearing about this for for years and so thankfully we've got some studies that are showing this now. I'm running low on time, um, so I'll just give you one, one more here. Uh, this is, uh, again, from Canada. Over 2,000 patients receiving treatment for opioid use disorder. Uh, looking at their past month cannabis use, about half of them had been using cannabis. Uh, there was no significant association be between self-reported cannabis use and illicit opioid use for three months following the study entry. So again, it shows that cannabis did not make anything worse. Maybe it made some things better. Interestingly, I was surprised by these results. 75% of the respondents said that cannabis use had no effect on their uh, opioid treatment. Uh, and 6.9% uh, said it helped with opioid cravings, 83 that it helped with opioid withdrawal. I would have expect, expected those numbers to be higher. So in summary, no association between any cannabis use and opioid use uh, uh, um, in people that are in treatment for opioid use disorder. Daily use, so if you get a little more granular with the data, uh, people who use cannabis daily and those who, at least the men who reported having cannabis-related side effects actually did have less opioid use. So this might mean that people are that are using it more frequently and maybe that are using higher doses of cannabis are actually having better outcomes. Okay, we're not going to have time for the CBD studies. This is a teaser. We'll have to get back to them uh, next time. But I just want to make a final point here. I've, I've got basically a case and two studies um, I, what I want to um, focus on here is that, let's see, where is it? Uh, you know, the big question of how, you know, how do you implement this? If you have a patient that's on opioids, where do you go for guidance to figure out how to um, kind of titrate cannabis, how to taper opioids, what to do? I want to direct you to these two papers. I was a co-author on this bottom one, which is a part of a Delphi like consensus process with a lot of experts. And then another one, and they basically give the same advice. You can find these both online. They're both open access. So um, you can check those out and, and we can provide links to them after the presentation. Maybe it, these are focused on chronic pain. Maybe things are different for people in opioid use disorder, but in my experience, uh, the same strategies apply. And then uh, I have a lot of information on healer.com, including this medical cannabis guide to help re reduce and replace opioids. That's a free download. You can go check that out there. And um, gosh, I think I should wrap up. I, I put all the, uh, the distilled version of it on here, but just go get the guide. It's, it's worth a read and it's short and effective. I'm going to take two minutes just to um, end with some images uh, because the opioid epidemic and other leading causes of morbidity, mortality, and healthcare spending, I like to think about the roots of this problem. That's a picture of cannabis roots. But let's just start here. We have this plant that can relieve suffering, and then this is what humans have done with it. You know, I think, I think this is really important for us in the cannabis field to remember. We also have a plant that has health benefits, tobacco. This is what we've done with it. And again, just to put this into perspective, opioid overdose deaths uh, around 50,000 to tobacco-related deaths, almost 500,000. So this is a huge problem. And then we have this health-producing thing that the earth gives us, and then this is what we turn it into. So it's the, the problem is really humans much more uh, than substances. And I think we have to be careful about this 
with cannabis in terms of false claims and false marketing and uh, synthetics and ultra potents and other things that we might do with cannabis to make it more dangerous, kind of like we've done with opium and tobacco and food. Let's not make cannabis more dangerous. Let's keep it safe and keep it healthy. And I will um, just give a, a quick, um, let me get through these and I'll just show a couple resources that I wanted to point out. Uh, if you're interested in the products that Healer makes, you can check them out on healercbd.com. We also have THC containing products just here in Maine and in Maryland. You can see all the formulas that I've created and uh, feel free to, to copy them or, or think about them. They're really good products. And then finally, I want to just point out, I've got this book. Uh, I got a, a picture of me receiving it. That was the day they came in the mail. I opened it outside with my boy there. I was just so happy. This is the Handbook of Cannabis for Clinicians. It's uh, I'm very proud of this. And if anybody wants kind of a soup to nuts resource, uh, you can buy this at any bookstore. I know it's on its sale at Amazon right now, but if you want to support a local bookstore, you can go to bookshop.org. And that's all I have for you. Sorry to run over and I'm happy to answer questions. And we are giving away a signed copy of my book during the fireside chat. And uh, so you can enter uh, that drawing as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Sulak. I know that that was a little rushed and I apologize for that because it was such a wealth of information and we really appreciate you being here with us today. And congratulations. Oh, you know, on I'm, I'm always trying to fit in more than I can. So thank you for bearing <laughs> with me. But, uh, but there's uh, so much to talk about in, in this topic. And as you can tell, I'm really passionate about it. Absolutely. Yes. And I um, have a copy of your book. So it's absolutely a wonderful resource. And congratulations. I'm sure that was a labor of love. Absolutely. <laughs> so let me check over here and see what kind of um, questions we might have from the audience here. I know when a, and anybody who has any questions for Dr. Sulak, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we did have one um, of our attendees ask, is there a medical role for the use of concentrates for pain? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I've had patients with severe pain that have received better relief from concentrates than anything else they've ever done, cannabis-related or non-related. So yes, there is a role. Uh, the problem is it's hard to make it sustainable. Most people that find this great relief with concentrates end up using the concentrates enough that they build tolerance to it, and, and then they don't have uh, relief from the concentrates anymore. So, that's, so, so there is a role. Be careful with it. See if you can get results with a lower dose uh, would be my recommendation, but there is something unique about this rapid elevation in blood levels of THC. It's kind of like that zero to 60 in two seconds is somehow better than zero to 60 in 10 seconds. And, and I, don't, I don't know physiologically why, um, but I, I don't like to start there. But if I'm not having good results with people uh, using cannabis or not enough results, then we would go there. And then the, the big question is, how do you use it sparingly enough that you're not going to build tolerance? Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, another question that came up is, how do you manage cannabis for chronic pain in oncology patients, especially when they're needing immunotherapies as maintenance therapy to lessen disease progression? Ooh, good one. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we, you know, amongst <laughs> colleagues, we have this conversation a lot about cannabis and cancer immunotherapies, in particular, the, the PD-1 inhibitors like nivolumab. So th there's two studies out of Israel that are suggesting that when you use these drugs that are designed to increase inflammation in the body and hopefully use that inflammation to target the cancer, that using those drugs with cannabis, and there's evidence with other anti-inflammatories like steroids, uh, that the cannabis or the steroids would reduce the effects of that treatment. Of course, cannabis is an anti-inflammatory. You're trying to stimulate inflammation, then uh, you, you might you know, not get the full effect there. I don't think, like some of our colleagues, though, that this is a firm contraindication. And that's be because a lot of the people that are using these immunotherapies have a terrible quality of life. They're at risk for side effects like pneumonitis and colitis and, and all sorts of other inflammatory side effects. And so my perspective is I, I like to use cannabis always at the lowest effective dose, never building tolerance to it, giving a window if possible 
in the couple days before and say the week after the immunotherapy infusion where they're not using cannabis at all, if possible, and if not using just sparing amounts. And I, I you know, I, I don't see the world as black and white. When I see my patient that's using immunotherapy, I know they've got a quality of life. They need to sleep in order for their immune system to function. They've, they've got pain. And so that's, in general, I think, um, you know, evaluate each situation clinically and really synchronize with the patient's goals. And if they're just straight up 100%, I want to do whatever I can to make this drug work and to kill my cancer, then, you know, okay, pull back on cannabis and you're going to have to look at other things for analgesia, perhaps opioids, uh, you know, unfortunately. Um, but if, if it's not that black and white, then I think using cannabis sparingly is okay. That's my opinion. I really appreciate that response because I do feel like there is this um, narrative out there that it's, you have to choose one or the other. And, you know, I think what the studies demonstrated was that it did improve symptom management, even though there wasn't necessarily disease progression either. You know, they just had a decreased response rate. So many of them are stage four and really looking at the patient and evaluating what's best for them is such a, a good message to put out there so people don't feel like, you know, they're having to choose that they can improve their quality of life. Love it's that. It's true. I don't know. We get, you know, it's so rare that cannabis does something bad. I feel like amongst, <laughs> in this field, like us clinicians, like when we find out there's something bad about it, we really jump on it. Oh, now we can't use cannabis for that purpose. But I, you know, I really dug into the research on prednisone and these mm -hmm. PD-1 inhibitors, because a lot of patients do develop colitis or something like that, and they get put on prednisone. And there's evidence that prednisone inhibits the effects, and it, it, terrible data. We really don't know how mm -hmm. how does prednisone, say, compare to cannabis. Is If cannabis is able to spare prednisone, is that going to be uh, a win for the patient? Probably yes, but surprisingly, mm -hmm. the data is not actually out there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, too, You know, looking at that. Uh, let me see here. Uh, there's a comment here from one of our attendees. I was a chronic pain patient. I thought the opioid tolerance was in my head. Um, I didn't really know that that was a thing. So uh, thanks for clearing that up. For yeah, her. that's a thing. And um, that's a thing that's part of the hyperalgesia also. I mean, I, I think much more common for people to build tolerance and need more and more opioids mm -hmm. over time. But then the opioids can actually make the pain worse by yeah. dysregulating the opioid system. It, when people are on them for a long time, that can lead to in super intense pain and other weird things like allodynia, brush their skin and they jump and cringe. You know, it's uh, a lot, lot of problems with um, long-term use. And I guess what I didn't, you know, mention Eloise and, and we usually do in these talks is that uh, opioids are great for acute pain they're great for mm -hmm. post-surgical pain. They're great for end-of-life pain. They certainly have their place. It's when we use them for chronic pain that they become such a big problem. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I think that's really important, you know, and I'd like to see more research around using cannabinoids for acute pain because I don't think we have good evidence there. And, you know, maybe we help patients never even get into that cycle of becoming chronic opioid users if we're treating their acute pain with cannabinoids initially. I agree. This is another one that people get like really touchy about with cannabis. Oh, it's going to make acute pain worse, which it can do in some situations. But I totally agree with you. It's not that cannabis is good for chronic pain and bad for acute pain. I've had many patients that use it for acute pain. And now there, there are, we're starting to see a little bit of data suggesting that um, at least Marinol uh, in the hospital setting can be useful for acute pain and, and spare opioids in that setting. So mm -hmm. great. How unfortunate though to have to use Marinol versus <laughs> the actual plant, but you know, we'll take whatever evidence we can get to build on. <laughs> yep. Let me see if there's any additional questions here. Um, it looks like we might have one more question here. I don't see any questions. I think, um, Oh, somebody did ask, do you have any thoughts on max doses when we're looking at using cannabinoids with PD-1 um, inhibitors? Yeah, I, I know I have dose. a max. Yeah, what do you say, Eloise? I'm curious. Tw um, 20 milligrams of THC or less a day is sort of where I keep people at. And with CBD, I don't really see any evidence to support whether or not, you know, that is uh, countering the effect of the inflammatory response. What about you? Yeah, I, I, I would probably go there. I don't know that I've had it in my mind as like a stable max dose, but I'd say in general, in treating chronic pain, I have few patients that are over 30 milligrams, and that even includes cancer pain. I, I really try to stay below 30 of THC a day for a lot of patients because 
Otherwise, we, we run mm. the risk of building tolerance to THC and losing those benefits. So, um, but everybody's different, you know, and, and again, like synchronize with your patient, uh, figure out what their uh, highest values and real goals are, and then tailor your plan appropriately. And, and don't find, if you find yourself in, a, in Eloise's 20 milligram box or my 30 milligram box, then check yourself because there's always exceptions. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about cannabis medicine is how much we get to individualize and personalize it and really help people improve their quality of life. So thank you for your work, Dr. Sulak. It, thank you, it's such an honor. Uh, it's an honor also. I love being your colleague and I, I love that you invite me to these educational events. Trust me, every time I get excited. So thank you. Oh. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers uh, here and to Leaf 411 for this incredible service. I mean, this like is part of the heart of the cannabis community, right? Like service to others is, is part of the spirit of this plant, I feel like. And so thank you for embodying that and making it a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So glad you could join us.